Since they first appeared in the 18th century, Freemasons have provoked speculation and aroused fantasy in Europe and across the globe. With their enigmatic symbols, secret rituals, and supposed influence in the political and economic world, no other organization has generated as much fascination and hostility. They say that Freemasonry is secretive, but no, it's discreet. With World War II, this hostility came to a head. Convinced that the Freemasons held political and esoteric secrets, the Nazis launched mass robberies of European Masonic lodges in occupied countries. Were there esoteric documents in these archives? Yes. To have possession of the secret archives of the Freemasons was to fight from within to destroy their influence. It's the largest collection of Masonic archives that's ever been brought together in the world. What became of them? What do they contain? Our investigation unveils the secrets of the Freemasonry Archives' incredible journey. June 14th, 1940. The victorious German army enters Paris. The capital is declared an open city. Like Belgium and Holland, France has fallen into Hitler's clutches. So what happened in Paris in 1940 is the German army arrived. When an army arrives in a city, it tries to neutralize and then occupy the centers of power. And in the mind of the Nazi leaders, power in France was located in the ministries, the government, the political parties, but also Freemasonry. The Nazis rounded up tons of sensitive documents belonging to the police, foreign affairs departments, trade unions, and also Masonic lodges. The Freemasons are often associated with the French Third Republic, and rightly so. From the very beginning of Nazi occupation, the French lodges were occupied by German military police. Dieser Logentempel wurde von unseren Truppen in Paris entdeckt. Die internationalen Freimaurer umgaben sich auch hier mit kindischer Symbolik und albernem Prunk. Hinter dieser Tarnung verbargen sie jene großen politischen und wirtschaftlichen Transaktionen, die einer kleinen Clique von Plutokraten, Finanz- und Waffenschiebern riesige Gewinne verschafften, ganze Völker aber den Elend preisgaben. The Wehrmacht and Gestapo broke into the most important Masonic lodges. The Grand Orient of France, the Grand Lodge of France, and the Doyuma. In Paris and Bordeaux alone, there were up to 50 raids. The operation was repeated in the provinces. Between June of 1940 and February 1941, the entire recorded history of French Freemasonry disappeared. In the imagination of the extreme right, and especially the Nazis, there was the idea that in Western Europe, Freemasonry was pulling the strings of liberal democracy. And there was definitely this idea that they would find information that would explain the resistance of Western democracies to the new European order. With his rise to power in 1933 in Germany, Hitler ordered that all Masonic societies be dissolved. He would put repressive policies in place in all occupied countries, but especially France, where there were 49,000 active Freemasons. In occupied zones, Masonic lodges were immediately closed and arrests took place, especially of people who had held positions in Freemasonry. 
While newspapers were placing the blame for the military defeat on Freemasonry, the Germans continued their methodical robbing. Plundering was entrusted to various Nazi agencies, each with its own agenda. First, the RSHA intelligence service, which merged several services, including the infamous Gestapo. They were the ones who first visited the lodges to seize the documents. And then there was also Alfred Rosenberg's military staff. Rosenberg himself was not a policeman, he was an ideologist. He was the linchpin of the denunciation of Jewish Freemasonry, of Judeo-Bolshevism. And starting in July 1940, Hitler entrusted Rosenberg with the mission of searching the libraries and archives of enemies of the regime. And that's what he did. The Germans took all of our archives. What they were interested in finding varied according to who was in charge. Everyone knows that men like Rosenberg were especially attentive to anything esoteric and to the inherent spirituality of Freemasonry. At once anti-Semitic, anti-Catholic and anti-Freemason, Alfred Rosenberg was a conspiracy theorist and believed that occult powers ruled the world. He wanted to produce evidence. From the summer of 1940, Rosenberg's military staff raided the Masonic archives. Conspiracy theories stoked the flames of the National Socialist worldview. But there was also a pagan branch of regime officials who wanted a new Germanic religion. This mystical movement, which was a mixture of Nordic myths and ancient occult doctrines, arose from a secret racist organization, the Thule Society, which had influenced the Nazi party from its inception. The Thule Society was actually formed by a breakaway Masonic lodge, meaning it operated totally independently and was very much into esotericism. The Nazis were attracted to its philosophy and took inspiration from it. Founded in 1918, Thule's members included future key figures of the regime, such as Rudolf Hess, the Führer's right-hand man, Hermann Goering, and of course, Alfred Rosenberg. The Thule symbol even inspired Hitler for his sinister swastika. This didn't prevent him from subsequently dissolving the group, which was too fanatical in his eyes. Alfred Rosenberg was faithful to the teachings of the Thule Society and remained convinced that the Freemasons' archives held tremendous secrets, like the alchemist's philosopher's stone, believed to have the power to transform lead into gold. But to focus solely on Rosenberg's obsession with the occult would be to forget that the archives also held great political importance. The Germans took over the headquarters of the Grand Orient on Rue Cadet, taking hold of the archives. All of this lasted for weeks, months. And then after a while, the Vichy regime was set up and there were discussions between Vichy and the Germans. Vichy said we should handle the Freemasons. We still have authority over some sectors of the occupied zone, and therefore this is our responsibility. And that means all of the Freemasons' belongings and archives should be transferred to us. On August the 13th, 1940, secret societies were banned. And at that point, the Secret Societies Department was created, which was partly based at the National Library. The idea was to document both the current affairs of Freemasonry, so there was intelligence carried out by the police, and then it was also about referencing, creating a library for the future. Euh, pour, pour l'avenir. 
The director of the Secret Society's department was Bernard Fay, an anti-Mason historian. He published a monthly anti-Masonic newsletter, and with the help of a hundred zealous employees, he exploited archives left behind by the Germans. Fay and his team kept records on 150,000 people from all the Masonic obediences, often taking things to the absurd. They even kept files on thousands of members who were long dead. They kept extensive files on each of the 15,000 members of the Grand Lodge of France, which included their identity card, the functions they held in the lodge, their political leanings, their union activity, their beliefs relative to the values of the Republic. Sometimes the content of these records was extremely damaging. The civil servants all lost their jobs and some were prosecuted and deported. Dont une première liste vient d'être également publiée, ne pourront plus exercer aucune fonction publique. Il va y avoir la légalisation de l'interdiction des sociétés. The Vichy regime declared a ban on secret societies, not only banning their existence, but also seizing all of their property. This was the first major anti-Masonic law, and all civil servants were required to declare if they'd ever been a Freemason and swear they'd never re-enter a Masonic lodge if ever Freemasonry were to start again in France. Vichy enlisted turncoat masons to collaborate with the secret society's department. Using the archives and lodges, they created an anti-Masonic film based on the Freemason rituals of that era. Présentez la coupe aux profanes. Prononcez avec moi le serment. Je m'engage sur l'honneur au silence le plus absolu sur tous les genres d'épreuves qu'on pourra me faire subir. Je m'y engage. Vous devez connaître toute l'importance d'un serment. Si jamais vous manquiez à une parole aussi solennellement donnée, buvez. Buvez Buvez Que ce breuvage amer soit pour vous le symbole de l'amertume et du remords, Je laisserai dans votre cœur le parjure qui aurait souillé vos lèvres. Frère expert, emparez-vous du profane. In the Petit Palais, there was a big anti-Masonic exhibition, the first of its kind, prepared both by Vichy and the German embassy. It was a great success in Paris, and then it traveled to Bordeaux and other cities around France. À Lyon s'est ouverte une exposition de la franc-maçonnerie à l'exemple de celle de Paris. En foule dense, les visiteurs ont pu, après un regard au sphinx de l'entrée, visiter les décors étranges des cabinets de réflexion et les temples différents qu'abrite chaque loge. Ils ont pu examiner les insignes et les objets, les fantaisies macabres qui servaient aux initiations et aux réunions de cette société secrète, dont le sens s'était perverti et que l'État français a désormais interdite en raison des maux qu'elle a causés au pays. Belgian Freemasons were subject to the same persecution as their French brothers. Part of their archives were pillaged by the Germans, and the rest were used by Belgian collaborators, the Rexists, who settled in their lodges. The hunt was on. The Rexists were a far-right political party led by Leon de Grel, created before the war. 
De Grail wrote something in his journal, which resembled, besides eliminating the Jews, we will be nowhere if we don't also eliminate the Freemasons. Here, the same sinister tasks were carried out. They kept records on the Masons, they published names, they helped the Germans to flush out the brothers who were part of the resistance. A sculpture commemorates seven Freemasons who, in the Estervagen concentration camp, created the Liberté Sherry Lodge. We don't know how many Masons were arrested. We know how many were deported, shot, or died in prison, or were killed in battle in 1940. This figure is a little over 800. In France and Europe, persecution of Freemasons was not comparable to that of the Jews. It was mostly for acts of resistance that brothers were deported, like Pierre Brossolette, or those in the network Patriam Recupare. Here, hatred for Freemasons reached its horrible culmination. Anti-Masonry sentiment has existed from the beginning of Freemasonry. It started in 1736, with Pope Clement XII's famous papal bull denouncing the Masons. Masonic conspiracy theories became popular starting in the late 18th century. And in the early 19th century, the theory of the Judeo-Masonic conspiracy began. So these are very old concepts. The first proposition for a law that would prohibit masonry in France was in 1934. It was debated in the National Assembly, but not adopted. It is nevertheless interesting to note that such a law was even discussed. The right tended to be hostile or suspicious of masonry, as was the Catholic Church, especially the high-ranking members. The press was also hostile, especially during the Stavisky affair. The Stavisky affair, a financial and political scandal that nearly brought down the Republic in 1934, named after a swindler who had Freemasons among his many accomplices. The secret society's department scoured the archives attempting to prove involvement of the lodges, but in vain. They did find, however, proof of Freemasonry's widespread political influence, especially under the French Third Republic. Meanwhile, the Germans began sorting their thousands of Masonic boxes just a portion of millions of plundered archives from all over Europe. We usually think that the Jewish books and the art, all the very famous Jewish art collections from France were the first things that were taken and the most important things that were taken. But as it turns out, actually, it was the Masonic archives that were the first cultural property that were taken by uh, Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg. Um, and he reported to Berlin that, oh, there's so many archives and cultural treasures that are left behind. Uh, we must take these immediately to, to, to Germany. Nazi war machine was now in full swing. But for the Germans, the study of the archives was still considered important from a strategic standpoint. 
Why did the Germans confiscate Masonic archives? Because in the mind of the Nazis, Freemasons were one of the four powers that opposed Nazism and totalitarianism, along with the Jews, communists, and Democrats. The Germans were highly organized. They wanted to study their enemies. Alfred Rosenberg gave his delusions an intellectual gloss, creating an institute in Frankfurt that was dedicated to the Jewish question, along with an annex to study the Freemasons and part of their archives. Alfred Rosenberg had a very strong competitor, namely Himmler, uh, who directed the secret services for state security. And Himmler happened to have been very interested in Masons. It was Himmler's group that decided that they uh, should be heir to many of the uh, Masonic materials that were captured by the ERR. They had set up a, a research center for Masonic studies in two large Masonic uh, buildings of two of the largest German Masonic lodges in Berlin that were taken over by the Nazi regime because Masons were one of the first to, to suffer in, in Germany. These buildings became the headquarters for the Gestapo, but in the basements, they had set up uh, bomb-proof shelters for the libraries of the materials that they had collected, first of all from lodges all over Germany, and then of course from France also, and from other countries in the West, Belgium, the Netherlands. The boxes of archives were meticulously indexed by SS officers, Freemasonry specialists, historians, and a team of translators. Nevertheless, they were overwhelmed by the mass of thousands and thousands of documents, ranging from notes taken in 18th century meetings to early 20th century conferences on anti-fascism. A wealth of information for the specialists. But there was little time to make use of their spoils. Starting in 1942, and especially by 1943, the Allies began heavily bombing Germany, and so they began evacuating into the far-flung regions of the Reich. The Masonic archives were evacuated in part to Tanzenberg, where they were discovered by the Americans. But what makes their story quite incredible is that they were then evacuated to the east, in Poland and the former Czechoslovakia, regions that had fallen under the control of the Nazis. It was in these medieval castles that the SS hid the secret archives of the Freemasons. Their leader, Himmler, took a portion of them to his fortress, Wevelsberg, a place where he conducted strange ceremonies inspired by ancient times. I have written an article about rather curious research that the Nazis were doing and that Himmler's groups were doing in one castle in the Sudetenland, even of, uh, in 1944, at the very last year of the war, uh, they had a, a very special research group that were into esoteric disciplines, and there were about 40 different disciplines that were being studied in this castle, but they were collecting books on all these uh, occult subjects. Himmler amassed the largest esoteric library in the world with 13,000 stolen books. Books of spells, alchemical manuscripts, witchcraft trial proceedings. He also seized the documents that he considered most valuable from the European Masonic archives. Clearly, this Holocaust orchestrator, a technocrat of death, also paradoxically believed that the Freemasons held mysterious esoteric powers. Spring 1945, the Red Army and Allied troops destroyed the Third Reich, 
Once again, many different parties were eager to obtain the millions of archives that had been plundered by the Nazis. The archives changed hands after a few months because the Allies, the Americans, the British, the French and the Soviets, all scrambled to get their hands on them. This was first of all for military reasons. To obtain operational information, you need to have the enemy's archives. But they all reacted differently. The US gave them back to their original owners while the Soviets took them to Moscow, quite illegally. Hundreds of thousands of boxes of documents with official information about foreign affairs, military, police, unions, and also about Freemasonry, were confiscated by Stalin and secretly sent to Moscow. The Russians were also interested in the Freemasons not for symbolic or esoteric reasons, for which they had no use. It was the brothers' political networks that Stalin and Beria, his henchmen, head of the NKVD, the precursor to the KGB, wanted to investigate, to find out whether they had infiltrated the communist parties in pre-war Europe. Once the archives had been transferred to the Soviet Union, they were not stored in the classic fashion, in a university or in the National Archives. They were transferred to an archive department that answered to the KGB. It was called the Central State Archive. Translators were then requisitioned to dissect the archives with orders not to discuss their research with their families or else they would be sent to Siberia. By the middle of 1945, there were about 1.5 million of these files on Soviet territory. And it was imperative that their fate be determined as soon as possible. That's why NKVD leadership held a special meeting, where it was decided that they would set up the special archives. The Russian specialists were overwhelmed by the scope of the spoils taken from Germany, while Europeans remained convinced that these documents had disappeared during the war. We can say that it was a gulag of archives, in the sense that the archives were essentially deported. The veil of secrecy was typical of the Soviet political project and its practices. There was an agreement between the occupying powers in Germany that the pillaged cultural property would be returned to the original owners who had been robbed. And it's probably unsurprising that the Americans and the English were true to their word. They set up centers where people came looking for what had been taken. Whereas Stalin signed the papers enthusiastically and returned two or three documents saying, that's all we have. And then he kept it a secret for the next 50 years. At the dawn of the Cold War, the revival of Freemasonry in European ruling circles worried Stalin. The Russians are in a state of total paranoia. First, NATO's operational center was in the West, so you can imagine they did everything they could to penetrate it. But it was particularly interesting for them to use masonry, which was strongly represented in NATO, as it had many American, English and French members. It's clear now that masonry was a tactic for them to penetrate that environment. The special archives existed for 53 years, from 1946 until 1999. 
Most of the documents had been studied, translated, summarized, standardized, catalogued, and the time had come to make the records public. With Stalin gone, all of the archives that had been taken in Germany, Masonic or otherwise, were forgotten for nearly half a century. After the fall of communism, they resurfaced, thanks to the work of a stubborn American researcher, Patricia Grimstead, who rediscovered them. The role of Patricia Grimstead in this affair is central since she's the one who knew about these archives and pursued them with very little evidence in the beginning. And as you know, she was denounced as a spy. The former Soviets were not very happy with her discoveries. She played an absolutely critical role. It was at the end of 1990, in October, and I was working with a Ukrainian colleague who was allowed to go into the stacks, came out running to me, he said, oh dear, I can't do this anymore because there are all these signatures of Beria that I've seen. Lavrenti Beria, nicknamed the Russian Himmler, the man behind the torture and deportations of any and all who challenged communism. So it was about a week later that I was given permission to go back in the stacks and see more of these files. I found a top secret folder about the seizure by Smersh, the Soviet counter-espionage group. Beria had sent uh, instructions for a special team to go to a small village in the Sudetenland. This was in May 1945. They brought 28 freight car train wagons, sealed, of course, of French archives. The countries that had fallen victim to the Nazis were shaken to the core by these findings, as they discovered that whole sections of their collective memory had landed in the hands of the Russians. The Freemasons were alerted. As soon as I had confirmation that Masonic archives existed somewhere in Moscow, I organized a special group. They discovered that there were roughly 28,000 files. The boxes were numbered and well organized, as you can imagine would be the case of the Soviet administration of the time. The talks began very quickly. France organized missions, both diplomatic but also secret services, to take a look at what was there. And from then on, the French archives started being returned. But this was not without resistance, because the Russian Duma considered these documents to be a national treasure, that they were war reparations. The Foreign Affairs Minister was Laurent Fabius. I had some contacts in his office and so I knew they were reluctant. Reluctant because the Russians have a hard time returning what they've taken from others, but from the Nazis in particular, throughout the entire history of the Soviet Union. The Duma didn't refuse the transfer, it was just suspended. Yes, the plundered archives are still a sensitive issue for Russia, as is the entire memory of the Second World War, in fact. It's become a major focus of political discourse for Vladimir Putin. It's a sensitive issue because it brings to the forefront the way that Soviet practices were not necessarily in keeping with international law, nor did they respect their allies at the time, since France and the USSR were allies. There was no reason not to return 18th century archives to France. The collection contained France's Masonic documents, but also the archives of many other departments, 
when all lined up, the documents of the French police alone represented six kilometers. There were also the documents of political parties, unions like the CGT, the private correspondence of notable figures such as Leon Blum, not to mention the archives of the Protestant Federation and Human Rights League. I wrote a letter to President Chirac, dated November 25, 1997, asking him to intercede on our behalf to recover these archives. The idea was to influence his counterpart, President Yeltsin of the Russian Federation. From the moment the president became involved, things became much easier thanks to his exacting manner. France paid four million francs, which was not negligible at that time, that the Russians, since it was no longer the USSR by this point, had asked for, in order to microfilm documents that interested them, to pay for the packaging, and the creation of an inventory list, as they would be sending all of this to France in trucks. What became of this money remains a mystery. In Moscow, the diplomatic maneuvering of the European embassies intensified as each fought to recover a lost past. The Netherlands, Belgium and Norway began working on discreet negotiations and secret deals. At the end of 1999, we were warned that the archives could soon be returning to France, and we began to have meetings with the foreign ministry's archive management director, who orchestrated the logistics of the returns. We were informed just days before that the hundreds of archive boxes would arrive by truck on December 23rd at Rue Cadet. The Grand Orient of France, the Grand Lodge of France, and the Droit Humain were all reunited with their missing archives, as were the lodges in Belgium. And so we unpacked these boxes in a rather extraordinary atmosphere, because December 23rd was the decoration of the Grand Orient's Christmas tree, so there were lots of children running around. We brought the boxes up, and then we closed the door of the library, and we began to open the 750 boxes, just a small group of us, people from the library, my colleagues, and me. And then something extraordinary happened. We opened a box, pulled out a file, and we see Les Neuf Sœurs, which was the legendary lodge of the 18th century whose members included Benjamin Franklin and Voltaire. All of the archives had disappeared, probably at the time of the revolution or the early 19th century, so we had practically no documentation. A 19th century author wrote a huge book about the lodge, and he said, I'm writing this with no reference documents. And so here we find Les Neuf Sœurs, and we said, if the rest of the 750 boxes are like this, we're not going to survive. At the Grand Lodge of France, it was the sisters of the Women's Grand Lodge who combed through the archives. As in other lodges, they found manuscripts of rituals dating from the origins of Freemasonry, international correspondence such as letters of the Marquis de Lafayette and documents detailing the everyday life of the lodges. A collection of documents that would shine a new light on the role of Freemasonry from the Enlightenment right up until World War II. 
I'm very happy to see them in the home where they belong because I had been working with the archivist from the Grand Orient from the very, when I first learned about the Masonic archives in Moscow. So for me, it's a great pleasure and a great sense of satisfaction for seeing them here. Were there esoteric documents in these archives? Yes. Not in every one of the 750 boxes, but there were boxes of archives dating back to the 18th century. And in the 18th century, there were several branches of Freemasonry, a branch that was very in line with the Enlightenment, like that of Les Neuf Sœurs, inspired by the ideas of Voltaire or Rousseau. Then there was an Illuminist branch, which was interested in the secrets of existence with the unknown. And in their papers, we found some very important documents on an esoteric figure of the 18th century called Martinez de Pasquali, a sort of wizard we don't know much about, who taught a kind of Judeo-Christian Kabbalah. Martinez de Pasquali, one of the great enigmas of Freemasonry. He appeared in the middle of the 18th century and founded a new Masonic order where brothers who were occult enthusiasts could practice magic. But to reduce the Freemasons to such esoteric practices would be to indulge in fantasies just as the Nazis did. The archives are also a great way to demystify Freemasonry, especially for those who didn't know much about it, and show that we were vital to the European culture that crystallized around the 18th century, a culture that continues, or should continue, to inspire us. What fascinates the public about Freemasonry and continues to attract new candidates is indeed its esoteric and symbolic side. If it still works as well as it does today, it's because in the last decades we've seen a decline in religion. And those who go to the lodges find a spirituality there that they can't find elsewhere. Our symbols are not there to scare you. Our symbols allow you to work on yourself. Obviously, we can't explain every aspect of it to the public. But people have to stop thinking that we control everything from behind the scenes. No, we're just working on ourselves. Freemasonry is associated with the ruling powers because, historically, at the end of the 19th century, Freemasonry was a sort of political party alternative. When there were no political parties, who created the political platforms? Well, the Grand Orient did, in its lodges. The separation of church and state, the law of associations, national education, the law for paid vacation in 1936, all of that came from the lodges. But that was another era. Today, political parties are totally independent and don't need our lodges. So this fantasy that the Freemasons run France needs to stop. If Masonry's political influence has decreased, some networks remain active in economic sectors and headline-making scandals often lead the public to conflate Freemasonry with the players in these affairs. Were Freemasons at one time the masters of the world? Of course not. 
This is not the goal of masonry. You can't say that a powerful person picks up the phone to call a particular person to make things happen. No. This was never our ambition. Masonry does nothing in secret. Whenever there is a scandal involving Freemasons, whether financial or political, it always rekindles the fantasies, the fascination, the curiosity for what remains a strange institution. Strange because it came into being three centuries ago, because it follows rituals born in the 18th century, using talismans, and it gives the leaders pompous titles. So it's bound to arouse curiosity, when today we're a bit more into simplicity and modernism. We're not very YouTube and Twitter compatible, probably. What if behind this mask of power and secrecy, the archives reveal a different reality, one that's simply human, anonymous men and women trying to find themselves? If there is only one lesson to be learned from the Masonic archives, I would say that political parties of the right or left put society at risk when they are extreme. And we are vulnerable to this right now if we're not careful. You can draw parallels between anti-Freemasonry under Vichy and the current anti-Freemasonry. There has always been suspicion of cronyism, of the presence of Jews, but that's not what it's about anymore. The Freemasons of 1939 recruited members from the left, but today recruitment has widely expanded. The only party today that could feel threatened by the Freemasons and where you can find some anti-Freemasonry sentiment is the far right. These documents, which have survived the worst dictatorships of the 20th century, are now being studied by the Freemasons. But the work is far from over. There is that feeling of meeting old friends again after a long separation. When you think of the journey that these archives have taken, they left Paris for Berlin in a somewhat tense atmosphere. They were repatriated from Berlin to Moscow in the midst of bombs, and some things were lost because certain trucks were destroyed. And then they were returned from Moscow. What a journey! So after 50 years of absence, the documents of the Grand Orient have come home to the Rue Cadet. The Grand Lodge of France and the Droit Humain also recovered their documents. But what about their memories? We're sure that there are some archives that have not been returned. Most have been, and indeed it was great to see that there were both historical records and more common records about the everyday life of Freemasonry. So that's quite exciting because they hadn't been sorted. But some documents have stayed in Moscow. And in the old Eastern Bloc, some archives were very recently rediscovered, in quotes, in Minsk in Belarus. But I think we might still discover more archives or books. For example, maybe the lodges libraries in Poland. Yes, there's a good chance. In the Red Army's central archives in the suburbs of Moscow, we found dozens of boxes containing the unreturned plunder of the Nazis, Masonic rituals of high-ranking officials, alchemical manuscripts, accounts of pre-war anti-fascist networks. These thousands of invaluable documents are still waiting to come to light. Mm -hmm.